All right. So thank you very much for inviting for for the introductions and for the work you've done so far on on the field. And all of this will not be able to join the last two days, but I'm, I'm uh, happy that I'm here today and um, to listen to the rest of the of the of the of the talks, but also to discuss a little bit um, the work that we have done over the last uh, years. As you mentioned, this was happening kind of in parallel. Uh, with the efforts from um, in the in the in the UK side, so I'm going to also try to focus a bit on government engagement initiatives that we have done in the past, and and try to have a conversation about what is needed really for governmental bodies to um, make the transition or to trust the transition to to our in HDA. So this is not this is we, we are in collaboration. We are uh, I'm going to talk about this collaboration, but this is work that is coming from everyone in this group. Um, so our uh, our organization or our work group is called Decision Analysis in R for Technologies in Health or DART for short, and it's really a multi institutional collaboration of researchers um, from different parts of mostly North America and the Netherlands. And the aim is to expand uh, knowledge in decision analysis, increase accessibility to decision modeling, and empower others to construct our based decision models. So we run workshops, we do courses, and we write papers essentially that they try to make this, um, um, the, this the first step of getting to understand how to build a model in R easier. So the group, as I mentioned, um, is uh, multi-institutional and it, it was initially um, put together or essentially Miriam Conning uh, through, uh, uh, who is a senior researcher in uh, the Netherlands, in Erasmus University. She, joined one of the courses in so, at the Society for Medical Decision Making Conference, or actually multiple courses that we were giving at the time in, in the conference, and they were all very much revolving around the use of R for HTA, but for different purposes, survival analysis, valuable information, building a decision model. And so she realized why do these people don't talk to each other and do something that is going to be more um, structured around the use of R in decision analysis, he also saw the benefit of using R and the, even for educational purposes, trying to that you understand what you're doing. But essentially that happened, um, that was 2015, that's where we really started at the SMBM conference. But then, and it's funny because it, it happened during um, an election of, uh, we, we were, we were um, at the, event of the conference and on the side there were elections, Canadian elections, it was Justin Trudeau that was um, that just had started and Yanis, a Greek um, basketball player at the NBA, he also just started and he was so much um, so fresh at the time anyway, it feels um, like yesterday but it's already eight uh, years ago. Since then we've given multiple workshops at multiple places in the world and we have multiple participants going through and um, the some of these little red dots happened at places like um, Cadiz, which is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health, an HDA agency in, in, in Canada or the CDC in, in the US and um, we also did, uh -huh, did that for Zin in in the Netherlands, so there was the, there was interest from multiple uh, sides, but I'd say uh, you know depending on the organization, there were strong or at least some curiosity uh, around how to use R for the purpose of HDA. So since then, we've published as uh, Howard mentioned, we've published a number of papers on how to build and. Uh, models, oh sorry, how, how to build models, how to um, uh, structure them, some little tricks about how to build a model that allows you to, for example, handle time 
more easily um, and an overview of the use of our in-house senior sciences, which is already now maybe seven years old. Probably if you were to rewrite this paper, there's hopefully going to be a lot of changes in it. And quite encouragingly, there were about 270 people that used the papers and especially the microsimulation paper is, I mean, it's a nice feeling to see that others are, you know, being helped by the um, by work you've put out. So where we are now, I mean, clearly things have changed. Um, I mean, even the same people, you know, obviously, including us, that have been aging, that has been maturing. In the meantime, uh, thankfully, there were other initiatives that also um, grew. And I think that's one key bit, which is, you know, critical mass and uh, um, you know, a number of different um, a, a number of different approaches to the same problem uh, is always very useful. And so the question is, where do we, you know, where, what, where do we go, especially with regards to government? We tried to push for uh, access or uh, being able to access the HTA, governmental HTA agencies. Um, and as I mentioned in the past, we were lucky to be, and we still are providing workshops for the CDC, and that has been very, very active. That we have uh, held workshops at the Netherlands and in Norway at the HD agencies, and uh, members of us have reviewed the guidelines of Zinc for the development of models in R. And most recently, we've also put together a. Uh, uh, a focus group discussion around, or two focus group discussions around barriers and facilitators of um, R and HTA, where HTA governmental HTA bodies um, were heavily involved in that focus group discussion. And I'm going to talk a little bit about mostly the uh, our candidate experience, our experience with the CDC, and these barriers and facilitators workshop. So, interestingly, CADIS has been making consistent efforts on introducing R in their processes, not necessarily HDA submissions um, for now, but how can we how can either you know get ready for that and uh, but also how to use R internally to make processes um, more straightforward or uh, transparent and so we went there and we gave a, a workshop on decision modeling and and in our and survival analysis, in our, the reason for that is they, this, this, their oncology side is very strong, and lots of submissions in oncology and the partition survival models are very dominant there. So the survival analysis bit has been quite uh, important for them. So we 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 trained uh, folks from Cadiz, and the important bit is that they've also not only trained themselves but they hired people that they are are savvy and uh, as i as i think i mentioned a bit like they've created internal capacity and uh, a group that does r in hda internally which i find very useful within um you know if you want change i think internal change needs to happen so we've also developed with them um uh, an automatic dig digitization of uh, Kaplan Meier curves. There's going to be a talk later today about it, so I'm not going to go into detail, but they have been great in supporting that kind of initiative um, because they also want to be able to essentially reproduce work that is being submitted to them. In a similar spirit, um, they've, um, together with them, we developed. Um, capacity on building partition survival models in R in an as automated way as possible so that when someone submits a partition survival model in Excel, that it can potentially use the mechanisms and quickly uh, transfer it to an uh, R-based model. We created a toy model in partition survival model in R and um, uh, yeah, they helped us with um, developing further functions that we have within our packets dark tools. Um, sorry, how, how, how are we doing with time? 
we're doing fine for time. You still have almost 25 minutes. 25 minutes. Okay. I thought, okay. Um, so perhaps I'm not going to use it all and it's good to have discussion. Um, so. Oh, apologies. You have 13 minutes. Okay. Um, so the, the other, the other angle that we, we have been involved over the last few years were, is the training of uh, fellows in at the CDC with regards to the CDC monitoring. So the, the CDC has a, a prevention effectiveness fellowship program and some members have been informally receiving training from us through their workshops. And I think one of the leaders within the, the fellowship have also received training and they found it very useful. So since um, I think about three years now, we've been in the curriculum of the Prevention Effect Effectiveness Fellowship, where essentially CDC fellows would go through training and receive a standard, the, um, an introduction to decision modeling, which involves both theory and practice. But it's quite useful because, you know, also the types of questions that the CDC asks are a little different from the standard um, questions that uh, the agent, agency might be asking, but it's also an interesting um, uh, uh, process where we we have to train a group of um, sometimes biologists or like the, 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 the backgrounds are very diverse within the CDC. Um, the and and this has worked pretty well and has been spearheaded by Eva Hens, one of our uh, collaborators. So the last thing I'm going to uh, talk about is um, a recent effort that we've um, put together with um, uh, Anna He, who uh, is also working at SickKids. Uh, she's a scientist at, at, at uh, SickKids Hospital in, here in Toronto, and we, which has been generously funded from an internal uh, grant, where we put our barriers and facilitators focus group in uh, two focus groups in March, where we tried to elicit from the academia, industry, HD agencies and consultancies, what are the barriers essentially? And mostly, I mean, we focused mostly on the barriers and try to find actionable um, initiatives that they can alleviate or certainly reduce this, the burden of these uh, barriers and reduce the barriers and um, make access to our uh, smoother. So we invited them over a virtual, two virtual sessions. There was very lively discussion. I think some of you were, were there as well. And um, here I'm gonna just give you a bit of a highlight of some of the findings from that uh, sessions. It's, it's very um, uh, informal. It's actually the first time we're discussing about it in, in, a, um, in a conference. So um, this is not published yet, but we are, um, Putting together a, a paper that will describe the um, the findings of this uh, of this work. So I think we have so far identified five main themes around why people might be um, finding it difficult to um, switch to RNHDA, and I'm going to talk very briefly about each. Um, so there are structural barriers. So for example, uh, industry will put together a global model sometimes, and then if the when for submission in an HDA organization, but if half of the submissions are going to be half of the agencies are going to be accepting R, but the rest won't, this is going to create essentially a challenge because then um, the the global model does not work for every submission, or, and there needs to be two models which also obviously not very helpful, not very useful. Um, now, there's also rigid structures on HCA institutions and sometimes, the, for example, the requirements even within R for some organizations might be different than others and there's no such good standardization so far that will um, make this, um, the, uh, these submissions, for example, um, more straightforward. That, I mean, these are highlights of some of the structural barriers that have been identified. There's a long list of 
barriers and facilitators, but I'm just giving you the highlight, two or three bullet point highlight of the um, of each um, thing. So the other thing that was identified was modeling, ensuring modeling quality. So back to this concept of standardization, the fact that we don't have a standardized approach to uh, building HPA models makes sometimes quality control challenging. And it could also take time uh, because you might need to have to, you know, learn how to review a different way of building a model. Um, on the on the flip side, the, there is more, more economies of scale with reusing models and reusing. If, if once you, you know, there are, they can you can think of smart ways that you can create. For example, template models that they are and uh, that the quality is ensured, or um, you can create packages that they are standardized and approved by HP agencies that they can make this uh, much easier. Now, another thing that uh, another um, element that was identified as a barrier is the fact that versions always change in R, and of course, you might think there are solutions for all of these. Um, uh, and there are solutions for all of these, but the problem is that you, the HD agencies themselves, for example, cannot always know the, uh, the the solution or have to find a solution. It's it's the the amount of time need to be spent on identifying a solution of like ensuring version control and uh, 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 always working with that fixed R version, for example. And so, um, of course, there is this modern complexity theme where there is a trade-off between time spent building and versus running so there was some feeling from developers but also from the agencies that it's easier to build a model in excel if it's a simple one and it's hard uh, if it's a complicated one so you know how much time do you spend on building a model versus and in order to make it computationally efficient versus uh, you know, building. And if you if you were to build a simple model, there was a, um, a suggestion that if you were to build a simple model, build it in Excel, it doesn't need a lot of time to run anyway. But if you build a complicated and computational intensive model, it switch to R. Again, some people might agree, some people might not. But this is the kind of barriers identified. So we might not always agree with them. But anyway, I said five things. I didn't, I highlight six and apologies. Um, but um, another important issue was security that was identified as to um, the, the, the there, there are limitations of R in restricted uh, systems. So for example, governmental uh, institutions might not allow open source software or elements of open source software might make it it harder to install packages and so on. So there is this element of open sourceness that makes it sometimes an, an issue with um, use in government. And there is this perception of IT sometimes that open source is more likely a threat. And the last two bits, so moving to the last two bits, they, um, the human resource component is quite important. The needs of training and that it can be that can be quite demanding from from a time perspective as, as well. And, you know, if anyone comes from an HPA agency, a governmental HPA agency, there's not a lot of free time for for learning new stuff. Is you know, there are things that need to happen and quickly. So, uh, well, staff retention is another issue where you 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 train someone, they become good in use of R, and they move on, and then you have to invest again in other training. The staff resistance and the generational changes kind of come together where you have people that are maybe less willing to learn and if you've been using Excel for 20 years then it's going to be harder to switch. The um, yeah and I think the last bit about balancing cost and effects is this kind of argument about open source being free but at the same time you know it takes time to build a model and the investment can be expensive so how do we decide if it is more cost effective to build a model in R or in a different uh, software. So, as a side note, for that focus group discussion, we used a software called Miro, which I found it 
very, very useful. It's like a sticky note, virtual sticky note, and I thought of sharing it um, with, the, with the rest of the community. I, it's an excellent uh, software for that kind of work. At the same time, I haven't been involved in a lot of focus group discussion work, so it might be common use, but I found it very interesting. So anyway, so moving to the end of that uh, of, of my talk, I'd like to say a few things about what is the lessons learned with regard to working with um, with HDA or governmental uh, agencies, but also with trying to um, to invest time for ourselves in, in making others uh, comfortable using RMHDA. And especially within the government, I think the government needs consistency on what they provide and solutions that work kind of mm, all the time, if not like the vast majority of times. And, you know, in practice, this doesn't always have to be, that it's not always the case, you know, like, I mean, new functions have that bugs, new new function need debug, like they need someone to be um, reviewing them and making sure that things work as intended. And the nature of software development sometimes requires this kind of back and forth. And when you have a small, when you don't have critical mass, then there is expected that you need people to to better test and perhaps the government is not, or the AT agencies are not the right people to do so, of course. But at the same time, they are very, what, in our experience with Cardiff, Cardiff was very much interested on specific solutions for them. That was difficult to pilot them up with someone outside of Cardiff. So we need to find a way to provide to them consistency, I think, in our solutions. It has been great, as I mentioned before, for people like Cathy that they built an internal hub where uh, they have capacity, internal capacity to understand and develop their own models. They've developed shiny apps for making their work easier. So it, this, I think it's a, it's a great class. Um, it also requires senior leadership to see an advantage in in the work that we propose in, in R. And why R would be great, this needs to start from the top, I think. There's a, a, a need for critical mass, both from our end and their, their end. If five agencies across the world out of 10 or eight out of 10 come together and say, we need that, that's gonna obviously be what uh, it's likely to drive change. And the unfortunate barrier, at least for us, is that like, you know, somehow life gets on the way. So we, because these initiatives are focused on sometimes individuals and co individual collaborations with institutions, you know, seniority in work and kids and whatever else will come along in your life, uh, you, you can't be the one person doing that collaboration. Like there needs to be critical mass and again on our end, so that there is a, that the, the agency will feel uh, that they supported from a, a number of different uh, uh, directions in the in that HDA, R and HDA work. So I think this is what I had so far. And uh, oh, I sorry, I should have I, sh I need to mention that we are having a workshop at the end of August. If anyone is interested. Um, you can look at our website. If you will Google that workshop or that work group, you will find our uh, workshop at the end of August. And it's virtual, but you can also join in person if you feel like. And um, we are going to be looking for someone to help us with developing uh, materials to reduce the barriers of uh, R and HDA and to extend DART material and packages. So if you're in the job market, look out for a tweet from our group about uh, hiring. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Petros. It was really interesting to hear all the activities and your interactions with government and those uh, the six barriers and facilitators that you've identified. Um, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting um, project. Uh, do we have any questions um, in the chat? We don't in the Q&A. Petros, I, I have just one question. Um, 
of those six barriers, you, the one you didn't put up, and I'm kind of glad that you didn't, is the lack of training materials, the lack of example models. Did that actually come up or um, is, do people recognize that that's somewhat been resolved at this stage? No, I think that the training is one of the components that has been identified as a barrier because we you know we have put things together, you guys have put things together, but I don't think that this not necessarily uh, satisfies the requirements for training that the agencies or you know external users of R might 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 have. Um, I think there's space for training in different also types, maybe more asynchronous training or materials that are out there that people can access without necessarily have to go through a workshop in the classical form of it um, is, is required. So no, training, perhaps I didn't stress it enough, yes, but the training has been one of the, the dimensions that uh, were identified as um, in, in need, or at least that they're, that they're necessary for, for the development of, or for the reduction of barriers. Uh, we have one comment in the chat from uh, one of our next speakers, uh, Ivan Zimmerman, that here in Brazil, I think the lack of human resources in R is the most important barrier to adopting it in HTA. Yeah, the, the same, um, it, it's, it's, it's all very different here with regards to, especially when it comes to reviewer demand. I think a lot of the, the, the agencies feel somewhat uh, limited in the ability to accept models in our here because they don't think that they will have the reviewers that they can identify that they can handle these models at this stage and um, well again going back to training that's another thing you know how do you train people to review models as opposed to develop them we haven't done that ourselves and perhaps that's something that we need to think of doing in the future Okay, um, so we're, we're somewhat over time, so we'll draw a close there. And thank you very much again, Petros. And um, there are some questions appearing in the chat, which Petros.